Morning, boys and girls. Do you know what day it is today? What day is it? It's Palm Sunday. That's why we came in and that he had that huge, wow, from this angle, wow, you guys really went to town putting all those palms on the cross. You know what happens on Palm Sunday? Jesus, he walks into Jerusalem where he was going to die on a cross and then rise from the dead. Now, what's this? A horse? Donkey. Horse, a pony? Maybe not a donkey, right? Is this a real horse? No. How do you know it's not a real horse? It's hard. It's, it's hard, yes. It's not moving. It's not moving. It's not blinking. It's not blinking. Yeah, I can't it see it blink. It doesn't talk. It doesn't walk. It doesn't talk? It doesn't walk. It doesn't walk? horses talk. What else about this horse? Are horses normally? It doesn't go moo. You're silly. You're silly. What, what else is... Are horses usually this small? No. How big are horses? Pretty big. Pretty big? Are they taller than you? Yeah, most horses are really, really tall. To get up on them, you have to put a saddle on, get stirrup, you have to put your foot in and reach one over. You almost need a ladder to climb up onto a horse, right? I'm going to go horse riding in Georgia when I do dance. Yeah, one time I went horseback riding and the horse threw me off. And I fell a couple feet on the ground because you're so high up. Okay, so you're high up. <laughs> yeah. Boys and girls, you know what a king and queen are, right? Yeah. What are they? What are those? They're oh! They're really, they're really, really rich. They're rich? They have a castle? Do you think a king has a small horse or a big horse? Yeah. Big, big, big horse. You know why that is? Because when the king rides into town, he wants everyone to see him. He wants everyone to see the big crown on his head. So he's the highest, highest, highest up. He's on the biggest, tallest horse, the best horse anyone can offer. Now, boys and girls, some of you were telling me already, Jesus, when he goes into his kingdom and into Jerusalem, what is he riding? A big, big, tall horse? No, Not even a horse. He's riding a little tiny donkey. You see, boys and girls, Jesus, he's a different kind of king. He's not a king that wants to rule with an iron fist to show just how rich he is or how powerful he is or how many castles he has. Jesus is a servant king. Does anyone know what a servant is? Hmm. Aspen. Someone who does work for you. Someone who gives up time and energy and does the chores around the house. Good job, Aspen. What does Jesus give up for you? His life. Hmm. What, what, what do we say, Liam? His life. He gives up his life. He doesn't just do the chores around the house, but he gives up everything for you. And Jesus makes that known as soon as he walks into Jerusalem because is he on the highest, biggest, most powerful horse? No. What is he riding? Oh, a, don- a, t- tiny donkey. a tiny donkey. Maybe a little bit taller than this. So that he is lower than everyone else because he had not come to be served, but to serve. Amen? Amen. Let's pray, boys and girls. Remember, we pray. We fold our hands, we bow our heads, we shut our eyes, and we repeat after me. Dear Jesus, Jesus, thank you for loving us. Thank you for caring for us. Thank you for riding into Jerusalem. Not on the biggest horse, but on a humble little donkey. Help us also to serve each other as you serve us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, boys and girls, we'll see you after Sunday school. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. When I was a student in college, I did the normal student life. You know, throughout the week you go to class, you study, you work hard, and then on the weekend you kind of slack off. You know, you you party a little bit, you spend time with your friends, you hang out. And many of you know at this point, because we just had the Concordia Nebraska Acapella Choir come here, that I actually went to college in Nebraska. 
And needless to say, the college I went to was very, very small. You drive two minutes away from the college and you're in cornfields for the, as long as the eye can see. Uh, the nearest town that had more than 10,000 people was like 30 minutes away. Uh, so there wasn't much to do on the weekends. So my friends and I decided, okay, we'll just spend time on campus and we'd just do stuff at the college. And one place he would hang out was the, the Student Fellowship Center. There were couches and a fireplace and all sorts of things. One Friday night, my friend Isaiah and I were in the downstairs of the Student Fellowship Center where there's a foosball table, a ping ping pong table, and and one lone pool table. And there's no one else down there, and, you know, I can't really play pool that well. Uh, And that might be an overstatement of my abilities. And Isaiah really didn't know much about pool anyway, but there's no one here, so why not fire up a pool game, get the pool cues, throw the balls on the table. And so we start playing. So far, it's kind of an everyday, normal story. A few minutes later, two people walk by in the hallway. I don't know what's going through their heads. I've never met them before. But they think, huh, we're kind of bored. Let's, let's watch this pool game. And so all of a sudden... I go from having no one watching me not know how to play pool to, oh, I've got an audience now. Get the shoulders loose. Come on, let's, let's make sure I've got I to impress them a little bit. Okay, so we have two people watching us play pool. A few minutes later, there's a group of four friends walking down the hall, and they see us playing pool. But not just us playing pool, but there's two people watching. So maybe it's going in their head, oh, this might be an interesting game to watch. So all four of them walk to the pool table and surround us. So now I've gone from zero people watching me not know how to play pool to six people watching me not know how to play pool. And they're getting a little bit lively. They're getting a little bit excited. They're starting to make bets. Who's going to win, Isaiah or me? All right. And a few minutes later, a group of six is walking down that hallway. And they see six people watching a pool game. This must be the greatest pool game ever played to justify this huge audience. Meanwhile, me and Isaiah have no idea what we're doing. And 12 people are around this table cheering us on, making bets, taking sides. Yeah, I definitely uh, crumbled under the pressure and lost that game. (laughs) I tell you that story because I think it compares very well to what happens on Palm Sunday. What happens on Palm Sunday? Jesus, he's on the donkey, marching into Jerusalem. He's at Jerusalem's gates, and there is a welcome party, all hyped up, all excited, ready to see him. Why are they there? Because they heard that Jesus raised someone from the dead, called Lazarus out of the tomb, and there he came. And so they're all excited. They're ready. They're shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. You know what that means? They're pointing at Jesus and saying, This guy, he is our true King. Whoa. You imagine the people in Jerusalem responding to the bedlam that's happening outside. What's going on? Who is this person? But Palm Sunday... Just like the 12 people who had no idea that neither of us knew how to play pool, uh, is a story about the crowds not knowing what's going on. Because when they look to Jesus, they are seeing the wrong kind of king. It starts with the word Hosanna itself. Do you know what that word means? It means save, save us, Jesus. Now, Christians say Hosanna to mean save us from our sins, save us from death itself. But that's not what these crowds were thinking. These crowds were thinking, Jesus, save us as a true king, march into Jerusalem and kick Pharaoh's behind. Wipe out these Romans, because you are our king, our commander-in-chief, our general, and you can make an army. And what army can lose if you can raise people from the dead? You can see why the crowds were so excited with palm branches in their hands. Nevertheless, they did not understand. Do you think Jesus was smiling riding that donkey? 
We see pictures of the time of Palm Sunday represented, and you see the crowd smiling, and the disciples are even smiling, and sometimes they depict Jesus as smiling too, but I don't know if Jesus was smiling. There might have been butterflies in his stomach knowing what was about to happen to him, knowing that those very same crowds who were saying, kick Caesars behind for us, our true king, would be the very same crowds that would be with the chief priest shouting, we have no king but Caesar, crucify him. The crowds did not understand, but Jesus certainly did, that he was here to be a different kind of king, a king that would not overturn a tyrant, conquer nations, but a servant king who would give up his life for the people around him. The crowds did not understand. Jesus understood. Do you understand what Palm Sunday means for you? What Jesus means for you? You see, when Jesus was walking into Jerusalem, he had a mission. A mission, not a temporary one, not for a temporary kingdom, but one for an eternal gift to give to his people. One to conquer death forever for you. The greatest gift you could ever hope to receive. Jesus himself talks about it this way. It's like the kingdom of heaven is like you're in a field somewhere and you find a tiny little treasure box under a rock. In that treasure box, you find a priceless pearl. So what do you do? You go to the owner of that field. You sell your house. You sell your car. You sell everything you have so you can buy that field, so you can get that treasure box, so you can have that pearl. What Jesus gives us is the same thing. It is a priceless gift. For where else can you go to receive eternal life? Is there anyone else who's risen from the dead? Brothers and sisters, if this really happened, if Palm Sunday happened, if Jesus really died on that cross, and if Jesus really rose from the dead, then there is nowhere else for us to go than at Jesus' feet, the servant king who gives up his life willingly for you. Let me close with this. We've been growing at Grace Lutheran Church. You notice that over the last couple years? It's been very exciting having more and more of our young kids. We have like 20 kids up here today and, and seeing all them rambunctious running around. It's an awesome thing. And more and more parents and families here at Grace. It's a blessing from God. But sometimes when churches grow, and I know this from experience, as you're sitting in the pew, it can very easily become like you're almost an afterthought, like you're turning invisible in a sea of people. But let me tell you, that is just not the case in the eyes of our Lord Jesus. Because when Jesus is walking into Jerusalem, he was not thinking of the crowds. He was thinking of you, Iris. He was imagining your face. He's thinking of you, Cheryl. You, Debbie. Thinking of you, Jeannie, who else am I going to pick out? <laughs> Bill. He was thinking of your face when he was on that cross. And Linda, when he was thinking of you on that cross, he wasn't thinking, man, Linda really screwed up. I'm mad at her. No, he was thinking, Father, forgive her because I want to see her in heaven. Brothers and sisters, not a single one of you is irrelevant in the eyes of our God. But Jesus has an individual precious love for each and every one of you. He offers you that treasure individually. Believe in him. For he is the source of eternal life, eternal meaning, and hope for all of us. Whether everything in our life goes right or nothing does. Because Jesus has conquered death, we have hope in heaven forever. The crowds may not have understood. Sometimes we may not understand the great love of our God. But when Jesus was walking into Jerusalem, 
he understood the great love he had for each and every one of you. In his holy and precious name, amen.